Welcome back to Golden Rule Radio, your weekly recap of the precious metals markets and the news that moves the markets. And we're moving into that six months and it's done middle of the year time frame with options expiring last week and a big Fed jump, uh, three quarters of a point that Robert and I talked about. I thought it would be fun this week to bring a old sage friend of ours back to the show. You know him, you love him. Welcome back, Rob. And Thank thanks you. for joining me. Thank you, Miles. Good to be here. So, Rob, it feels quiet. Robert and I brought this up last week. We're now six weeks into about $60, $70 swing up and down in gold from around 1800 1875 Long term, it looks healthy. I mean, we keep putting in these kind of higher lows and we look to be bouncing up the stairs a little bit. But it's slow and steady. Is this just summer doldrums? Is this just sell in May and go away for a month or two? What do you think is going on? That's a great question. I'm looking at it from a standpoint that we are range bound in plus minus the mid 1800s. The interesting thing is everything that's going on around it, the sell off in the bond market, the sell off in the stock market, the sell off in the crypto market. And gold is shrugging it all off. It's just holding its ground, which makes me happy. I like the fact that gold is steady and solid and doing what it should do as the rest of the world around it is losing their minds. I like that, steady and solid. And I think that's a good argument. I mean, what are we looking at with the dollar index Mm -hmm. on a global scale, right? Up from the low 80s to the highest in over a decade. Right. And people don't understand that. I had a guy ask me, why is gold not doing anything? I'm like, well, the dollar is up significantly. He goes, well, if the dollar is so strong, why am I paying $5 a gallon at the pump? I'm like, okay. Yeah. Do you know what they're paying in England? <laughs> I mean, when the dollar's up, we're not just talking domestically. We're talking the dollar internationally. Right. And I think that's a key thing to remember. I'm glad that gets brought up because as much as it feels like it hurts here, it's worse everywhere else. Right. And the dollar remains a life raft with holes in it, just the fewest amount of holes. It's the healthiest horse in the glue factory. Well, and the healthiest horse in the glue factory just got a nice little bump in interest rates. So you would expect to see that bond yield curve looking pretty good, right? Not so much. Not so much. So, and I know Morgan on his piece that he puts out every week has been talking a fair bit about the concerns of the inverted yield curve and short-term rates paying out better than long-term rates, which is a concern, which means that the bond market doesn't buy the fact that the Fed is going to stick to their guns. So is the Fed going to stick to their guns with a now 20% decline in the Dow, 30% off the NASDAQ? interest rates up, and it almost appears like they might actually be tapering back the balance sheet a little bit. Is this going to continue? Nobody knows. I think the bond market is holding steady here lately. Interest rate on the 30-year bond has gone up a great deal over the last few years. Same with the 10-year. I noticed just last week that the 10-year yield was suddenly higher than the 30-year Treasury yield. So it's not just short, short short-term rates. It's also the big indicator. The 10-year is what mortgages are hinged upon. And we are looking at a slowdown in the real estate market, a slowdown in building materials in terms of prices. I talked to a client the other day who's in the lumber business, and he didn't really have a lot of inventory, for which he was grateful because he said the value of their inventory was dropping precipitously, and larger companies with greater inventory were losing a lot of money for what they paid for their lumber for what they could sell it for now. So I'm grateful that as a company here at McIlvaney's ICA, we hedge our inventory because we have a great deal. And so market fluctuations don't matter. We either make it on the hedge or if gold goes down or we make it on the product if it goes up. And it allows our clients to not be whipsawed as they place their orders. They're able to buy at the current market price. A lot of companies don't offer that. Right. And I think that's one of the reasons why I've enjoyed 17 years here, and you've got a few more than that. Uh, We'll leave it at that. But looking back to a 50-year-old company, knowing that you've got somebody you can work with, 
where market movements have zero effect, right. net effect whatsoever, and it's just a steady availability on both the buying and the selling side. Right. Making the bold assumption there's anything out there to buy, which can also be a problem sometimes. Can and be. we saw in 2020 and continues to be a problem to some extent in something I know you want to talk about this week, and that's silver. I do. It looks like we're skipping along a base formation here in the low 20s. What does the chart show us? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, one thing we've been looking at silver for a while here is this enormous trading range that it's been stuck in since the big run-up in March, April, May 2020, hot on the heels of the initial COVID lockdowns, taking silver from 12 13 bucks all the way up to almost 30 And then we've been bouncing between 21 and 30 now, that's a big trading range. You mm -hmm. don't think of a trading range being 30%, mm -hmm. of 50% of mm -hmm. the total market. Uh, so we're down at the bottom. We've been here a couple times. We've pretty consistently had market bottom between 21 and 22, a little bit of a double bottom, and then a reversal back up. That happened at the end of 2020, September, December, double bottom, then reversed all the way back up and actually put in a higher high up around 30. Then we came all the way back down and at the end of 2021, we had a market bottom around September, a double bottom in December, and then it bounced back up to like 26 earlier this year. So now it looks like we're doing it again. We put in a market bottom a little bit under 21. We may be putting in another double bottom here right now, and maybe we follow the pattern for a third time. I'm not entirely sure. But I think being at that 50% retracement level, I think it's completely reasonable that you could see, especially if we see a major equities market sell off. Mm -hmm. This is what you said a second ago. It's not just looking at gold, it's looking at all the things encircling gold. If we have a little bit of a market sell off, like say 2008, and you have some unwinding of hedged futures and options contracts, there's no reason you don't see the equities market pull the price of gold down with it. But I think we're already seeing a taste of the disconnect between, say, an equities market pulling down paper contract gold and what the cost of actual physical metal may be. Because it's been two years since I've sold one of my clients a Silver American Eagle. Could there be other products like that? Well, the premiums on the Silver Eagles, you got gold down in the low 20s, and yet the premiums on the Silver Eagles put the prices in the mid-30s. Right. And the same is true even with products like junk silver. You know, it's in the high 20s, low 30s, depending upon which way you go. So the premiums on physical product belie what the actual paper market says it should be. And that leads to the question, what is the real price of silver? Is it what you can buy it and hold it for, or is it what the paper contract says it is? And the same is true for gold. We saw it in 08. We saw it again during the COVID drop, where in a matter of days or weeks, like it was in 08, the price of a physical ounce of gold was at a 20 to 25 percent premium above the futures contract, much like what we're seeing in silver today, where we're looking at premiums similar to what we saw in gold in 08 and what we saw in gold during the COVID meltdown. We'll have to wait and see. I constantly look for the best value for our clients. Leads me to 1,000 ounce bars if people can spend that kind of money, 20 something thousand dollars for a 1,000 ounce bar, but it's only at a 10% premium. And what I find interesting about that is I think you can argue you're seeing that across the board in commodities as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. You know, you brought up lumber. I guarantee that lumber pricing increases at Home Depot, what you and I pay retail, and the way that that has increased over the last number of years does not equate to the timber companies. Right. We know that's true with gas and oil because mm -hmm. we've been at these prices in U.S. oil and Brent crude and all before. But not but, at $5 yeah, at the pump. Yeah, not at 5 and $6 a gallon at the pump. It yeah. was a lot. It was 3 and 4 Right. You know, it but was numbers we, we hadn't now. seen before. Yeah. But now we're at the same level with Brent crude and U.S. oil, but we're an extra... 
20, 30 percent higher at the pump. That's a great point. So you're starting to see this disconnect between commodities and paper commodities. Right. Let's call them. Yeah. So speaking of paper, how about the ultimate paper that exists, the old U.S. dollar, since we mentioned that earlier? U.S. dollar obviously still on a tear. I think the U.S. dollar is, just from a charting perspective, very overbought right now. Now that doesn't mean it can't go higher, but I think the U.S. dollars do a little pullback here in value. Well, and I think that bodes well for gold. Here we've had the dollar on a tear. Let's call it a 10% move higher from the beginning of the year. What's your read on that? Yeah, you're looking at the beginning of the year around 94 all the way up to 106. So okay. a little bit better than 10%. Yeah. And gold is what, up 1% or 2%? About 1%. In the meantime. So gold hasn't responded negatively to a nice jump in the value of the dollar. If we see the value of the dollar pull back, what is going to happen to gold? I don't see it going down. No. Very unlikely. I mean, unless you have a major move into a different asset class like stocks, let's say we had a 20,000 point run up in the Dow Jones, then probably the dollar and gold both go down. But I don't know who'd be funding that kind of rise in equities. Well, let's pull out your Dow chart because you've got some good numbers there showing the Dow, the money supply, the Fed's balance sheet. You've got a lot of moving parts on that chart, but they need to be talked about. Yeah, you and I created a plate of spaghetti, so we'll try to space this out a little bit as we go through it. But you're looking at the Dow taking a major run-up following COVID up significantly to where we hit around 35,000, and we're off around 20% now at this point, just under 20%. So we've almost hit that magical Jim Cramer stated Fox News whatever assumption that a 20% decline is healthy. Is <laughs> Okay, that's one way to look at it, is signaling recession, possibly even depression. So we've hit the point finally. I mean, the NASDAQ already did it. The yeah. S&P already did it. But here's the Dow, you know, the most conservative of all indexes. Well, with that being said, you got to look at that time frame from March, April, May 2020 until now. What and, drove it? Yeah, what happened to the Fed balance sheet? I mean, up significantly, trillions. Yeah. You know, what happened to interest rates? They started raising interest rates in 2015 uh, and COVID hits and they tank it all the way back down to the floor. So you've got a massive decline in interest rates, a ballooning of the Fed balance sheet, a significant decline in the U.S. dollar. I mean, this is when the U.S. dollar initially went from 104 down to what, 80 yeah. on the DXY? Yeah. Uh, and this huge run up in equities. So it's pretty assumed, I think, a lot of this is just going to go away. Well, if you look at it now, you can see the balance sheet is toppy, the money supply is a little toppy, and they started jacking up interest rates again. So there's credibility in the argument that the Dow has not hit a place where people should be entering. We could actually see another sell-off of the Dow, corresponding to your chart there. Oh, I think it's completely reasonable. And you look back at, say, the 2008 sell-off, that wasn't a single event. It was really two major events, mm -hmm. separated by a bounce. Mm -hmm. We did have the Dow attempt to reverse and continue back up and was unable to do so, and in fact ended up falling down off 55%. It's going to be very interesting to watch where we go from here. I think that the problem with Wall Street analysts is that they see bonds and stocks as being opposite of each other. When stocks are selling off, you want to move to bonds, etc. the other way. If bonds are selling off, you move to stocks. It's not working. Both bonds and stocks are down significantly, and we're just getting started. So what do you do? Go into treasury bills paying 2% when the stated rate of inflation is now 7 or 8? Well, it's a guaranteed loss if you do it that way. I do think, though, that you want to trim back your equities exposure. Your growth and income side of the triangle needs to be trimmed back to no more than 30, 33%. That's the max. You might even want to trim that back more. You probably want to up your cash reserves. We have programs set in place for people. If they don't want to sit in U.S. dollars, they can sit in a liquid account in physical gold. Yeah, I was going to say cash reserves when you're at 8% inflation. There's got to be something better than that. Well, I think the vaulted account does very well in that regard. You're guaranteed ounces as opposed to guaranteed 
dollars. And then your base of your triangle should be, if you're not at a third in physical holdings of metals, either in your possession or in your IRA, you need to be moving in that direction. Really get balanced. I think that's what these markets are telling us. Wall Street has had it their way for the last 10 years, where everything they do has worked. It's not working now. And their exposure, most of their clients' exposure, are way overexposed into equities and bonds. I think people need to seriously rebalance their portfolio in line with our perspective triangle. So Rob, once again, really appreciate you joining us. And I think that's sage wisdom. Like I started the show, that's why I bring you in here. (laughs) So I appreciate it. If you'd like to talk with Rob or one of the other advisors here at McIlvaney ICA about how to properly balance your portfolio based on purpose, based on mandate, based on long-term goals and market cycles, give us a call. We're happy to talk with you. We can be reached at 800-525-9556. You can find us on Twitter at ICA Gold or Facebook at McIlvaney Financial. Thanks for listening and have a great week.